Are we live? Yes. But tell me I'm live. <laughs> okay. Hello, Bird, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for patiently waiting our little uh, live tonight. Uh, today, we're going to go over the Bichon. Like, uh, uh, my, my goal is today to do the uh, major shaping and pattern setting. And then tomorrow, again, maybe around this time, I just can't uh, schedule my time. That's the problem. I was just going to announce it like hour, two hours before. Um, and then if you happen to be around, it's great. If no, you can always watch the recording. So um, yesterday I draw your attention to the breed standard, whichever breed standard of the Bichon you want to follow up. It's a FCI, it's a UK, it's a whatever, AKC, whatever standard you are going after should be representing the breed. So you don't go to UK show or you don't go to American show or the FCI show and you cannot recognize the Bichon. It's just not happening. So the Bichon is the Bichon. The words used to describe the Bichon in different words are the cultural difference. So that's kind of how the Americans or how the Europeans or how the uh, other people, which words they would use to translate the best possible translation of the original uh, standard of the Bichon that's probably written on the French. So that's the problem. Oftentimes, the breed standard got lost in translation. And I just want to uh, read again. So I, I draw your attention to the AKC because now I'm kind of like living here in America. If I want to show the dog, I'll probably follow up the, the lines within the AKC dog standard. And, uh, you know, the entire two pages got condensed to this, uh, what I highlighted. So this, what I highlighted here, is actually the, the, the wording that actually talks very specifically about what do you want to emphasize and what do you want to care about when you're grooming a Bichon. So the way how I'm going to groom Bichon today is not how you're going to groom Bichon. This is not how you groom Bichon. This is how I groom Bichon. And this is based of my understanding and my analysis of this, what I gave like a couple of hours maybe today and yesterday uh, to uh, reevaluate my already knowing things about, uh, about, a Bichon, uh, about a Bichon grooming. So let's now... Go, uh, go again, and let's see what did I highlight it in this standard. So out from two pages, I condense it maybe to, uh, like, let's say, three paragraphs. So you don't even need to understand and read the entire, web, uh, entire standard, uh, just rather to read a couple of paragraphs. So what does it say first? It says the proportion. So now, I, now I'm going what I, what I highlighted. It says proportion, and the same thing what we said yesterday. So the proportion, the body from the forwardmost point of the chest, so forwardmost point of the chest would be somewhere here, um, to the point of rump, to the point of rump, so whatever line this is, this is the forward point of the chest, this is point of rump. It says it's one quarter longer than the distance between withers to the ground. So let's say withers would be uh, somewhere here, let's say, and this would be the ground. So the dog, this is the height of the dog, this is the length of the dog, and the, the height of the dog, let's call it H, and the height of the dog would be, the length of the dog would be equal, H plus 25% of H. So uh, if, let's say, 10, 10 inches would be a height of the dog. How long would be a dog perfectly? How long would be a dog perfectly? If anyone is with us, you can write it in comments. So it would be 10 plus 25% is 2.5 equals 12.5 inches would be the height, the length of the dog, ideally, if the height of the dog is 10, 10 inches. Uh, if the, the height of the dog is 20 inches, you will go uh, like a double, it would be like a 25, 
and uh, like length of the dog would be 25 and things like that. Why this is so important to work with the numbers and to play with the numbers? Because as much as we play with the numbers, with the mathematically proven right, this is not Sasha told me, this is written in standard. And more you play with the numbers, oh, if my dog would be 11 inches, how long the dog would be? Okay, and I calculate, so there is, there is, a, there is a little more task for you. So if there is like a tasks, task for you home, tasks. Okay, what would be the task? One, dog height is 15 inches, length is how big? And the second one can be like length of the dog equals length of the dogs equals, um, let's say, uh, whatever, 27 inches. How high is the dog? So those are the questions you need to answer. That's kind of a little homework for you. Play with the numbers. More numbers you put together and more you play with the numbers, easier would you teach your eye, eye to recognize the balance, to recognize the right. You don't learn about the proportions by grooming dogs. You learn about the proportions by doing math. Because math will learn your brain to balance your eye to see the right. You won't, be, you won't know when, when I, uh, after I was like uh, exposed myself to this kind of teach, learning and teaching later on, I was just focusing myself on the math. So what I was not satisfied is by seeing dog that doesn't fit my math. And the math was not something that someone told me it's literally written in the breed standard, it says. So it's not that you are turning, why? Because why this is so important? Because oftentimes you will go to the grooming show and someone will put the dog and then they will teach you how the Bichon is a square, should be as short as possible, compact as possible, put it in a, put it in a square. And then when you do that, you are pre because that is why we have a Bichon. Bichon is a, described in the breed standard and it should look like it's described in the Bichon standard. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on with this. So what does it say next? Uh, the body from the withers to the lowest point of the chest represents a half of distance from withers to the ground. So what does what that, that says? So that's the next step here. So if this is a height of the dog and it's 10 inches, the highest, the lowest point of the withers should be in the middle of that height. So meaning that the depth of the chest should be five inches and actually particularly the length of the front leg might be of equal size. So it will be of ten, five inches as well. This is not my telling you the story about how length of the dog body should be. It's written in the breed standard, okay? Okay, compact substance is compact and medium bone uh, neither coarse or fine. So that's already. You don't want to have an, a chubby dog that usually you would see the Bichons very chubbily groomed. And then when you touch them, you would come, come, the, come down to this. When you touch the body, there would be a nice substance and actually very compact and medium bone through. Not coarse, neither fine. So that's very important. Which, and then also, which, com which part of the dog's body refers to is the dog compact or not? Like what part of the dog's body refers to the dog's compactness? Are you maybe aware of that? In order to answer that question, we need to know another answer, uh, ask ourselves another question is what the compactness actually as a, as a what compact as the, as the word actually means? What does it mean for something to be compact? When we talk about live animals, the compactness has very much um, uh, uh, ability and actually very much uh, intense uh, uh, ability into interp in interp interpretation into a function. That's important. So compact is a dog that functions with the less use of energy. What does it mean? Function, what does it mean? Dog, dog doesn't function when they are sleeping and when they are laying down. The dog functions when they are moving. So the movement is very important when analyzing the compactness of the dog's body. 
And there is a specific part of the dog's body that creates a crucial role in compactness. That's not written in a breed standard, it's a kind of the common knowledge about the dogs. And in order to answer that question, we need to understand the logistics of the movement. And now I'm asking you, if, you're, if anyone with us is there, watching this movie, watching this recording, is which, how the, how the dog's body, how the dog body move, which leg moves first, front leg or back leg? Front leg or back leg? Which leg moves first? Front leg or back leg? Which leg initiates the movement, front leg or back leg? Every one of you that said front leg were wrong, and every one of you who said back leg initiates the movement were right. Back leg initiates the movement, and that's why we oftentimes hear in standards, rich drive, pushing the body. What happens is that the back leg moves towards first, and then the entire body moves forward, and the front leg reacts in order for the body not to crash on the, on the head. So the body pu get pushed, pushed by the energy, initiated the movement. And that is why we have entire back of the dog, like a, like a, like a, um, a sacrum. Sacrum is a bone within the spine. As well, the pelvis is very strongly created. Those, uh, uh, you don't have a joints. Uh, within the within the within the within the sacrum bone, and neither you have a joint within the bones that create pelvis, and that's very important because those bones uh, kind of create this momentum, like we are going to the to do the to do the, the bow and arrow, like you are pulling back in order to move it forward, and then that's why the energy gets compact and 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 kind of and kind of uh, very much uh, pointed and uh, accumulated within the sacrum and then pushed forward through the spine in order to initiate, you know, answer the movement because that movement needs to be very fast to the brain and reaction of the other uh, limbs and uh, uh, like uh, uh, parts of the body that creates movement itself. So with that said, now we have a back leg that initiates the movement and front leg that reacts on movement initiated. What connects those two parts is actually the loin. The importance of the right structure, length and loin, dictates and brings compactness to the dog's body. If the loin is long, then the energy that's moving from back through the spine forward gets lost or gets downgraded and doesn't connect back part of the dog's body with the front part of the dog's body. Back legs and the entire front part of the dog's body that starts with the forechest ends up with the last rib, that's the front part of the dog's body. And the last hand, hand quarters are the back part of the dog body. Those two parts are connected with loin. So the loin is the most important part of the top line. And the compactness of the dog's body in itself relays on a structure, compactness, shortness, or actually accurate size of the dog, dog's loin. And in majority breeds that are not uh, arched by standard, not uh, high in back, like some caught on the Tular, Badling Tots, or uh, Old English Sheepdogs, for, to those dogs this structure does not apply. But for the majority of the breeds, the, 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 the exact size of the loin refers to 25% of the top line. Top line is measured from the highest point of the leader to the base of the tail. And no matter how long it is, the loin should be 25% of that size. And the loin is everything that you find in between last rib and the sacrum bone, pelvis. Where the pelvis starts, there they the actually loin ends. So all of that in between that connects back and front is actually creating compactness of the dog's body. That's why it says compact and of medium tight, neither coarse or fine. That's very important there. Okay, what we have here, it says uh, eyes, very important. Eyes, eyes are round, black, dark or br dark brown and set in the skull to, do, to look directly forward. An overall large eye is fold, as well as the almond shape oblique is fold. 
this is fault. Almond or two round eyes are fault. So now you exactly learn from here which kind of expression your dog should have. The, here, you know that everyone that makes those angry faces, I was one of them. I was one of them. I find them very cute, but I, later on, as I, as I talked more about a Bichon, I more and more understood that if you want to present a Bichon in the, in the way the Bichon should be presented, that regardless of my taste, the breed should represent the breed itself. And that's where the, this uh, drama of where do I can put my taste in is actually taking away or taking, uh, giving to a quality of the dog itself by my grooming. Okay, okay the skull is slightly rounded, allowing for round and forward-looking eyes. So finally, here you have an answer to the question, should I make my Bichon have a round eyes that are forward-looking and seen completely out from, the, from, the, from this round head? The answer is yes. I wanted to spell it, I don't know how to do it. So yes, yes. Yes, you want to have your eye be seen. And then what does it says forward? Uh, we go here and now speaks about, okay, the skull. Slightly rounded, allowing from round uh, forward looking eyes to be seen. The stop is slightly uh, exaggerated. Okay, now there, there we again. Stop should be slightly seen. Now, how do we do that? I don't know. I'll try and I'll see. I'll see when I look at that and I'm going to see, is this something that slightly exaggerates or it's not? Okay, let's go, let's go forward. Uh, I wanted to come to a muzzle, the one, uh, the eyes create an, oh, oh, this is the important one. The line between the outside corner, corners of the eyes and the nose will create a near Equal, equal, uh, equal length of triangle. So uh, we have eye, we have one eye, we have another eye, and we have a nose. So it says the line from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here would be the same. Would be slightly all the same. Okay, we know, now we know that too. Um, what do we have? Okay, neck. It says, the arch neck is long and carried proudly behind the erect head. It blends smoothly into shoulders. The length of neck from occipit, from occipit, from occipit till, till where it blends into a, into a shoulder, into a top line. It says, what is? Is, a proclim is approximately one third the distance from the forechest till the back butt cock. So now, now we are again here to this one that's actually, let's say, is 20, 12.5 inches. So if my length of the dog's body is 20, 12.5 inches, how long should be my neck be? It should be 30% of this, so it goes like 12.5 times 0 0.3. How much is that, Vedrane? Twenty-five. Twelve 12.5 times 0 0.3. How much? 3.75. 3 Oh, you didn't see this? Okay. So it says 3.75. Now what it's, it says, a neck. So if the dog, length of the dog's length, is it that like that? What does it say here? Uh, neck, neck. It's approx from occipit to the withers is approximately one third the distance from forechest to backcock. Yeah, it's 30%. That's 30%. It's three times three. 75, it's almost four inches, let's say four inches. So if the dog, and now you, you again, play with the numbers, play with the numbers. Again, you can add here, uh, uh, equal, if your dog, 
height is 15 inches, dog length is what is, and then add here how neck, how long should be a neck. And also add that question to this one. If the length of the dog's body is 27 inches, how long is the head, how long is the height of the dog, and how long is the neck. Play with the numbers. More you play with the numbers, more you're going to be able to see it faster. Uh, okay, let's go forward. Uh, the chest body, the top line, top line is leveled, except for a slight muscular arch over the loin. Slight muscular arch over the loin. Okay. Uh, the top line, that we said that the chest is well developed, wide enough to allow free and under uh, uh, free movement of the front legs. The lowest point of the chest extends at least to the elbow. So the lowest point of the chest extends at least to the elbow. And we said lately it should be here. And then here would be the elbow. At least it can go... It can go deeper, but it's rarely seen. So at least till the elbow. The ribcage are moderately spring, sprung, like uh, round, and exhibit, uh, extend back to a short and muscular loin. The forechest, forechest is pronounced well. You saw yesterday when we, do, when we were doing to this guy, like he didn't have any forechest. But now we need to create a forechest because the Bichon should have a forechest. And I saw a lot of books, the lot of books that are actually talking about a Bichon trim, trimming dog without a forechest. You will see a lot of these guys, like a modern, like a modern trims, like a, uh, how you say this, uh, Bichon trims, perfectly smooth and wonderfully groomed, but without forechest. It's not according to breed standard. Maybe it might look cute. Maybe it might look uh, fancy, but it's not according to breed standard. You don't give a flare by ruining the, what's literally explained in the breed standard as a great characteristic of the dog. You can give a flare at the places what are not specifically explained in the standard. That's kind of when, when you come to a, well, I was an opera singer, so I know that, like, I, how do you, you know, when you work with the big conductors and you play, I don't know, Cavaradossi or you play Traviato or you play something, and then you have all of these guys, like, young, I was the same, so I, I was, you know, I get to the place of piano and I uh, start to sing with the corepetitor and the uh, conductor would be there, and I start, like, beautiful, and say, what are you doing? It might be beautiful, but that's now how Puccini envisioned it. In order to give a flair, and the Puccini, Cavaradossi, what sang like a billions of times, uh, always the same and the same and the same and the same and the same. Yet every one of the big ones had their own flares of how did they interpret the what's already interpreted like for a billion times. But you cannot do that at the places which are specifically known for what a composer wanted to express with the significant portions of the aria or the, or, or the piece of the art. So you don't go and put your two senses at the places which make this breed look as this breed. No matter what and who teaches you, you have a guidance. It's not about me. It's not what I said. All of this is what the standard says. I would maybe love to see more than 3.75 long neck in the Bichon if the length of the top line is 12 inches, or I can just not imagine the dog that's length of uh, like a, uh, 12 inches is maybe not enough. This dog has at least 14, we, 13, some 13.9. We measured it yesterday. So I would maybe th think that the occiput to the length of the, uh, from occiput to the, to the, to the withers, or actually to the, to the, yeah, to the readers, to the top line, the dog should have like 3.4 inches. And we would all love to see these beautiful swan necks because they just said it should be approximately. If it's approximately, maybe we can just add a little more extra for the flavor, maybe, because they said approximately. But they, they didn't say approximately um, half of it or third of, or a fifth of it or whatever. They said like third of it. So if our dog is like 
long, like 15, 12 inches. The third of that is like four, like a third of that is uh, four inches. There we go. Uh, so what we go here next? Um, yeah, here the re okay there and the underline has the moderate tuck up. Underline has the moderate tuck up. So you need to have a moderate tuck up. It's not a straight line. It's not without line because you would oftentimes have those have those streams. The people will say, okay, you do here and you come in and you blend this beautifully in. And where this line ends, your back, your back line starts. No, it's not, it's, no it's, it's, that's not what the standard says. The standard says moderate tuck up. You can, you can uh, with the tuck up, you can very easily screw the entire picture. Because the, if tuck up is not on the right, and tuck up is this little part there, it's not, if not on the right place, you might end up having a picture of the long dog. But don't be scared to have a slightly longer dogs because what they want you to do is to have a quarter longer dog than its height. Now all of that changes once we have a coat. Everything doubles in sizes. The dog height is not anymore where the height of the dog is, but when you, where you leave the height of the dogs to be with the level of the top line where you choose to be. You can increase the height of the dog by a couple of inches by leaving a... Because the dog should always look like they are born like we groom them. And it's no grooming. No grooming is there done. What, what the standard is going to ask you on the end to do? Let's go to the next page. Is that the shoulder blade, upper arm and forearm are approximately equal. So what does it say? Like a shoulder blade, it says like... Um, where can I do? Like here maybe? So the shoulder... Shoulder blade, this is too little. Shoulder blade, let's say like that, and the upper arm should be the of equal A, B, so A equals B. So if this is, if A is five, then, then the B is five too. What it says is that actually they should have approximately 90 degree in between, two of them, where it says the shoulder blade would be moved for backward approximately 45 degrees. 45 degrees backward, creating uh, a, approximately 90 degree angle with the with the up uh, with the uh, with the um, how you call this one uh, forearm. Yeah, the shoulder are laid back and nearly 45 degree angle. So that's what I said. Now the upper arm as extends um, well back to the elbow that is placed directly below the withers when watched from the side. So we said like here, it's well laid back and blends into the elbow. And this is now elbow, but elbow is set well under the highest point of the wither. So this is elbow. So this one should go a little bit like that. For example, let's say this is not good. These are, it's 40%, this is the 90, but this should be like, Elbow, highest point of the leader should be under. That's kind of like usually to majority of the breeds. Um, the elbows are uh, held closely to the body. Okay, so they blend nicely to the body. Uh, the pastern slope slightly from vertical. So they are like sl uh, from the vertical. So that, that's very nice when, when we groom the Bichon front leg. Right? The, the slightliness. So this one can be like that, and slightliness of this sometime. It looks very nice when you, when you just slide it a little bit from the underside because it can give them that little extra of the height, of the, of the, of the length. Because instead of messing the length with a, with a tuck up and then ruining the entire picture, what we can do is we can do it a little here and just make an illusion of that, the neither need to. I'll, I'll show you how I'm doing it. It shouldn't be like uh, so, kind of like uh, too much of the of the of the doing. But slightly millimeters can help a lot. Okay, it says like um, mm, uh, da 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 da. Tight are very feet and round, so that's we know like round feet to the bichon. And it says nails are kept short. That's what it says. Nails are kept short, and as shorter nails you have. Nicer, tight, tighter paw pads, paws you can you can create. Uh, 
Because oftentimes you're not able to create a nice, pa a nice pause to the dog, especially to the bevel foot, if your nails are too long. Especially the nails, and now at this point, like to the groomers and everyone watching this, like a fr front, a front nails, front nails, the nails of the front leg are so important for the overall balance of the dog's body that it can ruin the entire picture. Not only the balance of the dog you groom, but the uh, level of the dog's, dog's health can be can be ruined by the front front uh, front uh, nails that are too long, because what's happening? The entire dog's body should rest and lay on front legs. That is why the front legs are not attached to the body with any, any joints. The front legs are attached to the body by muscles. Why? Because every, they are, they are amortizi am amortizing, amortizing, amortizing every movement. So whenever the dog lands on front leg, the body moves like amortizer, like amortizer. They move back up and down, up and down. So the entire dog's weight actually holds the front feet. Yeah, the sh like a shocks on a car. So in the entire as 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 uh, so entire dog's body is actually holding on the front feet, front feet. Oh. If the nails are too big, what's happening? Instead of laying on a pause on a pads, right? The 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 long nails are pushing the pads backward, creating more pressure on the this big portion of the pad, the the the, the end of the pad that actually ruins the balance and biomechanical model of the front leg that loses its balance and instead of the weight, instead of landing on the front feet, is actually translated to the hips. And there is why we have so many little breeds that might expand a fake with dysplasia as commonly learned, uh, known uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the world, like how the little dogs have dysplasia because they're overwhelmed with the long nails that are actually creating much more pressure on the hips because the entire, the entire weight is now shifting from the, from the front leg to the back. And that's, that shift actually creates a pressure that when the dog moves, actually they're grinding their bones of the hips much more than usually and should be. And not only that, it's not, it's not ending on the hips, it's actually ending on the, on the, on the, say over. Near balls, like a hawk, hawk, right? And then you have a lot of dogs that have a, a lot of little dogs that have a hawk problem. And then it will, oh, it's because he's jumping too much. No, it's because the entire balance of the front leg ended up on the back. And what's the reason for that? Oftentimes, the, everything of that disappears if you keep the, the front <laughs> nail short. When I said short, it's mean really short to you know, learn, teach your clients to do it every day, and then the dogs can nicely rest on their pads, actually, on the pads where actually the balance is again moved forward completely, and then the dogs rest on the front pads. So that's kind of, and even standard says, the nails should kept short. Okay, the hand quarters. The hand quarters are medium bone, uh, well angulated, with the muscular ties and uh, separated, uh, uh, spaced moderately wide. So that's very important to know. And oftentimes the bichons are seen like this. Very easy to see this nice wide shape of the back legs spreading themselves widely. The upper and lower tight are nearly of equal length, meeting as well at the uh, bent uh, stifle joint. The leg from the hock joint to foot pad is perpendicular to the ground, so now we know which kind of hawk we should groom to the dog. It should show the perpendicular, uh, should be perpendicular to the ground, no matter of what our taste is, because the, the standard hijacked our tastes. Even though I oftentimes like to see more flair in the back legs, who care about what I like? It says how it should be. Um, and uh, that's it. Now we are coming to the texture of the coat is, at, is of utmost importance. The undercoat is soft and dense. The outer coat is uh, coarser and curlier texture. You would oftentimes see that judges that really know what they are looking for would go under the ears, uh, go uh, here under the... So wherever 
the dog has more motions going around, so it's easier for them to texture wherever the sh coat is a little shorter. What they are looking actually is for curls. So if you really know Bichon as a breed, you would know that you will want to have an, a powder puff a, a, a overall appearance, but you want to show slightly on a certain points that the dog does curl. Because then you're going to show how really you care about the breed you present. And uh, it says forwardly. Um, uh, okay, then it goes. The very, and now it says what's not. It's not good to be like this and like this. Okay. And the trimming. Look at now. We have a, we have a trimming section in a, in a breed standard as well. It says like coat is trimmed to reveal the natural outline of the body. Now I told you, all of this I was telling you what to do because all of this should be revealed by the breed standard because they said by the standard it says that the coat trimming is to reveal the natural outline of the body. It is rounded off from any direction and never cut too short as to create an overly trimmed or squared off appearance. No square portions on the Bichon body, no matter how much you would love not to see that. If you, if you want to do those kind of things, then you compete in a, in a, in a, in a, in a free salon freestyle. But that's what, that's, what I, that's what I was always, when I, grew, when I judged grooming competitions, I was looking for the people understanding this. Not to impress me with the European flares and standards and uh, they, I would get a message in the middle of the night for the shows that I was going. Do you like, uh, do you like uh, waste on the poodles? I said, what does that do with, do I like, should the poodle have a waste or not? It's not about my liking or not liking. I can like a salon freestyle. And then I said, this salon freestyle is a freestyle, and the pad, so it should, shouldn't be judged by the judge. The salon, 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 uh, salon freestyle uh, competition, I think, should be judged by the owners of the dogs. And they would come say, oh, I like this one, or like that one. I think that's what we need to strive for. You're either going to breed, breed up to the breed profile, or you're going to sal salon freestyle. Every single Bichon that's... Uh, that's um, styled in a sense of being extremely squared because it's nicer, because it's popular, is taking away the essence of the breed. It doesn't care about do I like it or not, it's care about uh, do I represent the thousands of years and thousands of breeders and thousands of selective breeding possibilities that should appear the dog in a way in which we should preserve the dog if we want to, you know, deal with this sport in, in future to come. So the, the furnishing on the head, beard, moustache, ear, and the tail are left longer. The larger head here is trimmed to create an overall rounded impression. The top line is trimmed to appear level. The coat is long enough to maintain the power puff look which is characteristic to the breed. And with that, uh, powder puff look, powder puff look, yeah. So with that said, now, the, now we analyze, and this is what I ask you to do for everyone that did the homework was yesterday here, wanted to uh, do something on their own. This is what I ask you to analyze. And today I analyzed it with you so you see how it should be done. And this is, you know, if I, I if I'm gonna create a, a video about this uh, later on for my YouTube, I would say this is this is not how you should groom a bichon. This is not how you should groom a bichon, because this what I'm gonna put on this dog is my interpretation of the words. My, interpret my subjectivity of this objective vision of the how the dog should look like. All of these are numbers. And th this is like a little task that I added to your agenda. This is what I came up here with, whatever is this here. And now what, what I need, where, do I, where do I go from here? I go from here in deeper analyzing 
the mathematically structure of the Bichon. It doesn't care about a beautiful Bichon that won Best in Show last year, last month in a, in a, in a, in a, I don't know which show, Atlanta or a, a Interzoo or whatever, because that's what the people are doing. You suddenly see someone won, and you don't know. We don't know. Like he was that the only one dog in a show. Like no one has competed, so whoever entered, they won. And now we are trying to model after that because we think that those judges, if they judge us, they're going to place us as well. It's not how it for life works. You know that uh, I'll, I'm just finishing with this now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna like shape this dog like in 15 minutes, and then we can rest until tomorrow. Um, and uh, there, there was an amazing story. I was, I was, um, I was, I, I was very lucky and blessed that I, I, while I was doing a seminars and t teaching tutoring for the groomers around the world, globe, I was invited by Shirley Carlston, one of the biggest industry icons I ever, I ever, uh, I, 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 I ever known for, and she was very impressed with my first appearance in the United States competition on Intergroom 2012. I won the bronze with my, um, with my um, poodles that I groomed in the second puppy trim, like a European puppy trim. But what's more important, that particular competition uh, uh, set me up for the, let's say, in that year, that was 2012, I maybe signed up people after that competition, signed me up for, let's say, maybe 100 seminars from that particular show. One of those seminars that I was invited was, was with a famous handler and the poodle expert in a field, Frank Sabella. We shared a stage one. And later on, we, we, we become friends very, very often. We, we shared, a, I was following him when he was judging. I, was, I would fly there to be his ring steward and he loved to work with me and loved with, with, to work with him. And I learned a lot next to him, but there was a specific story that he was talking about when um, in 2000, uh, 1975 or three or somewhere around 70s, he won the best in show with a, with, a, with a standard poodle, Gordon. That standard poodle was a, a big turnover and a, into way how the people would shape and trim and groom the English saddle. Because far back then, in those years, English saddle trim was the most uh, famous trim the poodle was shown in. And if you see the old pictures before two uh, he won... The, the best in show with the Gordon, you will see all the best in shows. It, it was many poodles best in show, standard toys, mi miniatures. You would see all of them with a, with a big lion that was actually not even trimmed at nothing. Those lions were amazing and falling almost to the floor. And then you would see all of these uh, show little legs and puffs and everything else. And there you get the Gordon tightened up short and short. He was like so short that he was like, how the heck you go from this ginormous lions into this tightened one? And then he tells the story about Gordon. He tells the story. He said like, I finished Gordon in spring of some year, let's say March. And then the Gordon was uh, shaved down and he put the dog in a kennel and he was not uh, thinking about showing him anymore. And what happened is actually that somewhere in October, he was like maintaining his coat, but nothing much. What you can grow like in a, in a year in a standard poodle of uh, the, the Gordon was humongous, like, a, like almost, I think, on a, he said like it was like almost on the, on the you know, on the, on the highest rate of the, of the, of the males. So you need to really like, you know, in order to maintain that code back, you need a lifelong time to get all of that code back. So in what he said in October, November, he said like, I don't have what to bring to the February show because the Westminster is usually called, held in February. So he's just a couple of months until the show starts. And he said, I was going through my kennel. I was looking for the clients. I was looking my dogs and was looking at No one appeared to me to be such a perfect dog like a Gordon was. And he said, I'll take you to a show. But he said, on the other side, he said, there is no coat on him. He said, but he's a good dog. He's still a great dog. I'll show the dog. So what he did, he let the dog grow the coat as much as he could. <laughs> if you see those pictures, you would see like very, very tight little, uh, uh, very tight little uh, 
um, the English saddle trim on it, very tight jacket with clothes up and the glass almost full and everything you see, all out from what the, the trend was before that. And the red, long story stored, long story stored, he won the best in show at the Westminster. But not because he groomed the dog in particular style, but because the Gordon was an exquisite dog. And what the people back then were really awarding was the quality of the dog. Today, it's maybe that's turning another point. Because you always want to be pictured by, as a judge or things like that, by exquisite, standing and perfectly looking dogs that oftentimes appear to be very deliberate and very uh, challenging way of understanding what's under the coat. Of course, when you get that final lineup of the dogs for any show, uh, you can go to the, to the details and it's like the, all the dogs that, that come to the show and line up deserve to be a best in show. But he said like all of them are the groomed to perfection and oftentimes we do forget like what the dog under the coat actually is. But back then, he said like, will the dog today won? The poodle, for example. Will the poodle won? If in a tight continental, if it's a tight lion trim, will the poodle won the Westminster show if in a German trim, if in a standard trim? They won't, regardless how great dogs they are. And then the Gordon won, and the next, next, next show, like next day show, everyone was cutting the poodle short. Everyone was taking the poodles short, and from that on he created a tr new trend. But not because he wanted to create a new trend, but because the dog was great and happened to be shaved eight months before the show. That's what we really need to look after. It's the standard of the dog, not the standard of the of the trim because there is no standard of the trim as you see there is a standard of the bichon that says that says everything that explained on the master classes on the videos on the, the books on the lines on this is described in these three sentences here one two three three sentences the coat is trimmed to reveal the natural outline of the body it is rounded off from the directions, from any directions, and never cut so short to create an overall trimmed or squared off appearance. The furnishing of the head, beard, and mustache, ears, and tail are left longer. The longer head here is trimmed to create an overall round impression. The top line is trimmed to appear level. The coat is long enough to maintain the powder puff look, which is characteristic of the breed. And a little uh, in the one, one paragraph before that, it says the texture of the coat is utmost importance. The undercoat is soft, dense, and, um, and the outer coat is a coarser and curlier texture. So what you need to do is you need to leave portions that will show the curliness of the coat. Because with that little thing, just doing little things that other doesn't see, in a books describing grooming, and that's your competitive advantage. That's, but where, where did you find that? All of this today and yesterday I spent talking about numbers, lengths, strength, shortness, longness, in order to come to the point to explain to you that everything I find here, it's not my imagination or my opinion. Everything here is a fact of the standard. Now, with that said, it's a fact. Those things are facts. As the more fact we put out, because the mat is a fact. So now, how do I transfer this mat into, the, into this? From here to here. So this is a triangle. Standard, understanding, it's this. So that's, this is a mat behind the standard. So that's the standard. This is a dog with its own faults and characteristics of the dog. And then there is me. I am the artist that want to put this beautiful little puffy into as much as closest to my 
my, my interpretation of this. So tomorrow when we finally get this little dog be finished, you will see how you not to groom be shown. Because in your formula, when you take your little dog, I, I always suggest you to take a model dog. You don't want this to do on a live dogs. Because you see, I, I'm talking here like for an hour. I want the dog to stay here, lay down, think about And now how do I practice this on a live dog? I need to have all of this code that I need to keep maintaining which kind of life the dogs have and where to use those dogs if I do not, if I do not, uh, if I, if you have an average grooming shop that you shave down all day. But you still need to be a master of your own craft. And this is where you can uh, master your craft on the model dogs. Because here you can stretch yourself, you, you stretch your limits, you stretch your mind and your body. You stretch yourself, but you do with your body and with your mind and whatever you want. But do not make someone else sacrifice for you to learn, for you to improve and for you to show your magic. I stopped giving seminars, lectures on the live dogs because we are in the era where the dogs are actually gravitating away from the long coat, so they don't need to have a long coat. Neither you need to have a long coat because you can artistic, or you can make your art on the dog. And here you can't have any excuse why you didn't do it right. You didn't do it right because you just didn't know better yet. So this is a standard in numbers. More numbers you play with, easier would be to, for you to see, to see. Then you have a dog with its faults, so now, now I will know what I need to achieve and can I, so what I'm gonna be higher, longer, this, that. How am I gonna make my eyes be pleased when see the picture? Because my brain gonna recognize. I will, I will, I will not measure my dog after I'm done, but I will look at my dog until I'm not pleased. When I will be pleased, when, you know, when you have those, like a click, like this, this is my eye observing the, the dog. And this is my knowledge about uh, numbers. This is a fact. And this is my eye. And they would just start trying to look themselves. I would try to do something more. And then at one, they would just click like this. And we say, oh my God, it's perfect. Leave it there. But for that, for that you need to learn. And that's only one aspect. I'm giving you all of this here at this point because this is not what I'm going to talk in my, in my, um, in my uh, challenge, three-day challenge. I'm going to give you all of this on Friday. Start, we start on Friday. I'm going to give you all of this because I know that you want all of this. But more importantly, I'm going to help you sort your knowledge you already have about dogs. Maybe you, have, you don't have these things. Maybe you don't know these things. And I'll teach, you, I'll, learn, I'll teach you how to learn yourself these skills and things. But I want to utilize all those hidden gems that you have in already your possession that can turn you from the local groomer, like a local, the lo local, no one, you know, local groomer, ah, doesn't sound well. And the people, oh, uh, and that's, that's how the people, uh, that's how the people treat us as an industry in general, right? You need to make yourself be artist, you need to make yourself be expert, you need to make yourself be a uh, local celebrity, local dog expert. And that's what I, what, what, what I'm going to teach you, how to change your how to change a percep public perception. What's the public perception? Your public perception is your local market, your people in your town, your people in your street, not your colleagues, not another groomers that you need to impress with a better, with a better job that no one cares in your community. But then you come, oh, but if I place my trophies, then they're going to see how great groomer I am, accepted by the community that actually doesn't spend nothing more than bitching about all of those clients uh, about how they neglect the dogs. They don't want those trophies. Not those trophies mean nothing to them. They might maybe for a short period of time, boost your self-confidence. But when you will see that those trophies doesn't, doesn't bring you any fulfillment 
neither help you long term succeed in your business, raising your prices, making yourself become more valuable person in the local community. You don't want your child to go to the school and then the other moms would say, oh, she's a groomer. Blech. Not that that's what we created out from our industry because the low self-esteem all of us had about ourselves. And then we try to fix it by going and competing and trying to reach the top 1% of the people that are untouchable. You can't join that class. Neither you are welcome there. And it's a lot of sacrifice. You don't go after them looking how they do. You go after them and see which, ki which kind of life they live. Thank you. Uh, uh, you go there and see which kind of life they live. Usually, I was on top, I know what that means. Usually, it's we all suffer with some sort of the anxiety, some sort of the addiction. I can't wait five o'clock to take a glass of wine, get whiskey, get high until tomorrow morning. Bad relationships, usually, because no time for them. Obesity, because I just wait for my class to be done and I'm just going to another pizza or ice cream so I can feel at least valued for what I did the entire day. And unfortunately, health issues of all kind. Is that the price we are able to pay and we are willing to pay in order to reach 1%? I was there. <laughs> and I kind of teach now every single one of you, uh, that's not healthy environment to be at. And you don't need because there is no money. There is money in the sponsorship. So you oftentimes you're paid to promote something you don't even believe in. But you're paid to do why you, you make yourself believe it's a great product because you're paid to do so. And you think that's the way how you make other people and other people, that's the, that's the thinking of the, of the, of the, of the brands is that like, Oh, if you are the, the perfect, uh, perfect celebrity of the, of, the, of the grooming industry and people see you use my shampoo, then it's meaning that every single one who wants to use my shampoo gonna think that by using my shampoo, they're gonna be able to groom like you. And that's a corporate structure. That's how the corporations make their money. By, by creating this illusion, something of that can happen. This is... This is where do you make your art. And I'll teach you how to use knowledge you already have and turn it into a money-making machine overnight. Raising yourself as a star in a local community. From the local dog coat cutter into a pet care expert. With the things you already do know, you just need to structure them differently. And when that shows to the market, and the markets need that more than anything else. Okay. I think I'm done here. <clears throat> do we have any questions? Uh, do we have anyone with us? Thank you guys for, for kind of being here. So to now I'm just going to do the... Now this was the hard day because I needed to go over the, over the things what I wanted to do. And now I'm trying to do the... Okay. So let's do the first thing first. What I want to do is first, usually. Well, so now, uh, can you see me? Is it good? Can I move back and forth like here? The dog is seen too. Okay. And can you hear me? Can you check? This, uh, this, this uh, mic like picking me up as well? Are you sure? Like this? Okay, so first what I like always to do, and actually we know it's to deal with this little expression, okay? So what, the, what they said, like whatever we do, this is now too much, uh, but whatever I do always first is I like take a scissors and I like make a nice little round. So I'll be able to expose an eyes a little more than they were before. 
by just creating a little, that's again, this is not how you groom the Bichon. This is my interpretation of the breed standard that comes from the interpreting the standard the way I told you. What? So this is the my way of interpreting the standard out of what I told you. What, what, what? I feel like women are more undervalued and shamed into accepting less until they feel confident. Yeah, but that, uh, you will never feel confident enough because it will all, it's, it's always about to stepping out from the comfort zone and doing what's supposed to be done regardless, regardless of the feeling. Because the feeling is always something that can prevent us from doing it. And then uh, sometime when we are forced to do something that's good for us, doesn't necessarily need to feel comfortable. But after doing it, the reward that comes back is much rewarding because you stepped out from your comfort zone. And oftentimes the breaking through the, it's not, it's, it would be, for example, I was very low self-esteem through the life when I went. It's because I, I have, uh, you know, I was growing up in a socialist country. I was growing up with the people, when the people, my, my, my father was, um, having like, um, how can I say, my father was uh, having a $5 paycheck and uh, I was grooming for $200. So that's where, where, where my dad was like, when I was bringing home my, my checks because I was doing it from, uh, from, my, from my home, um, when I was doing my checks, my dad would like cry on the end of the day and telling me like, this should be opposite. It's not you who should bring money to the table, but me. But the only thing why I was doing that is not because I felt comfortable or not comfortable, because I knew what was right to do, and I didn't, didn't let my emotions stop me from doing it. Because then we end up in this circle. And then that's what I was, I, I, I'm going to talk about that on, on the day number three, are the emotions. How the emotions are set us back for this continuum of, uh, obstacles that we cannot bypass and I'll tell you I'll share with you like what changed my life and how did I made myself uh, out from always judging and questioning every single move of my especially the fear of criticism how did I overcome that and how did I for example I just want to share with you how did I turn my TikTok into a money-making machine overnight like we had the increase of our my TikTok appearance that actually finally impacted my life, not because I share with the people how I groom dogs. They don't care about that. But what they, what they care about is uh, about the dogs, about their dogs. How to have a better life with their dogs. I, I wear our, our, uh, our, 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 uh, our organically increased its visibility for one. But yesterday they showed me like I was thinking like six point six five hundred thousand percent was something, but uh, TikTok went from one point three million percent increase in the visibility, only based on the topic I was starting talking about. Every one of us, every one of you, has that knowledge within. And but we we need to learn. We need to create a support. We need to create an environment in which you will be. Uh, supporting and feel support from the industry, right support. When I said, what's the problem of me sharing, the po sharing your post about your having your uh, uh, cosmetic when I'm doing it the same? This world is a world for everyone. And if we want to support each other, who will? Okay, so I'm done here. I'll come back to that later. Okay, because I, wanna, I, I want to do this line now. So let me just shape the... Yeah, you should play the music.
Would you mind listening to music, watching me without uh, any talks? Because I don't think so. I can talk too much while I'm grooming and I can do this very fast. Just I can't uh, talk too much. That's my problem. Who? What? Yeah, we did. I formulated it myself. Is that a question? I mean, like, I didn't actually know I'm lying. I didn't formulate it myself. I was doing it with a... I was telling to the people what I want to have as an outcome, as a result. And then they helped me doing it. They, helped, they, they formulated it for me. Take a dog in another room because he's gonna eat everything with it. Now I'm done from this side. So let's see what, what we have done. Just a little bit. What I don't like still is too, too heavy in this part. So I'm gonna take a little more out from this. Head is still too heavy for this body, up to me. Let's see here. Almost the same. I didn't measure anything. Like this is a top line. The front leg and the top line are the same. The, my elbow is under the withers. That's the same. The length of the dog, I did, let's, let's just see what we like here. Length of the dog body, as of now. So you see, I also, let me just go out and see. Out. Can you see it nice from the side? Hmm? Can you see it? No, you don't. 
si čau, če to vidi, jo, ti pa si mi nož. Ok, let's see. So the dog body So you see I have a fore chest, I have a front leg, I'm maybe there too uh, wide still, but let's see what, how, how big it is. It's like 13, and it's 10. So what do I have? I have like just a little bit less. If I have a 10 inches high dog, I just need to have a half an inch less on my fore chest and a little bit away from the back and I'm kind of already in a line. There you go. 12.5 with a 10. So that's kind of, so this would be, this would be something what I need to kind of keep. Uh, length of the front leg, depth of the chest, this is all good. Um, the line, let's see the, the head, this should be a little, I don't like this one here, so I, I should just actually take it like this. Okay, let me do now the another side too. This is first putting the lines in the dog. So it's not a finish, we're gonna finish it tomorrow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna again, so now we do the same. Now, now the, the other side is much easier because now you just need to follow the, follow the pattern of the, of, the one, of the one that you place there. Is there any time that you prefer tomorrow to go live? Because tomorrow kind of I have opening entire day. What would you love more to me for me to come? Like seven morning, seven morning, afternoon, or mid, like a night, nightish. Like this time. Like this time. The final day. And tomorrow we're gonna finish the doggy completely, so I can take some nice pictures in the Miami area. <laughs> What you want to do when you're shaping your dog, you just want to just want to care about the things that you don't that you don't go too much on the away from what should be done. Any any preferences? Huh? I guess you'll go whenever you can. Do we have anyone? Kolko ima? Kolko? Is there any preference for you guys when you want me tomorrow to go live? Pita, why should we go on your channel? Why should you cook it? You should call you Alexander. Yeah, oh, it's a live question? Mm -hmm. Oh, so why would you join our challenge, my challenge? You join my challenge in order to... So why, what the challenge is uh, actually now about? I was, in my career, I was like really highly paid... Um, the microphone is there. Uh -huh. I was really highly paid... Uh, show dog handler so that was uh, my my um, that was my um, my profession show dog handler i was handling one of the best show dogs at that time and i think like that uh, that area that era when i was handling the dogs the dogs were like really kind of uh, in and about so then i learned that competitive advantage knowledge i needed to have in order to serve one client at a time so when my colleagues were uh, handlers that were charging $100, $50, uh, up to a kind of like a success rates and access fee, things like that, I had my daily rates 
when I'm busy. Like a, the traveling days, days at the show and uh, paid expenses. And my day, my fee was like $1,000 to $3,000. Depends on was it a toy poodle or a standard poodle. And then uh, like how, many, how much time I should, I should have in uh, developing the breed and developing the, 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 the top knots and presenting them and things like that. So in order for me to perform, I needed to learn about dogs, things that were not a mainstream common knowledge. I happened to have one of the best mentors in the world. I was looking my mentors while, be, with an, um, magnificent glasses, but when I find one, I surrendered completely. I didn't ask why and how. I just watched what they told me to do. I was doing it what I've been to, told to do, and I developed myself in that one step ahead of everyone else. And that showed in my results. And then I was thinking, when I, I retired 2015 from the show dog, I was handling my, my portion. That was the last uh, toy poodle I had to handle. She was like, uh, uh, and she was winning the world champion title in Milan, a world dog show. But the most important that day, I won over one of my best mentors I ever had. He was wise winner, wise uh, reserve champion. And I said, you don't go better than this. I retired that day. I said, like, this is it. I'm not showing anymore. I'll just show from courtesy on the shows I would love to show. I won't charge any, any, anyone anything for showing dogs anymore. It's not me professionally. Then I was thinking to take all of that knowledge and bring it into a grooming industry where I started to hold a lot of seminars, a lot of, idea, lot of uh, trying to develop people and to help you guys achieve more as a groomers. Because I was thinking... If you would have skills and knowledge that I had in a show ring, that you can use those skills and knowledge in your everyday grooming shop. It's not how it works. And I saw my students over and over and over struggling. The wonderful groomers, the perfect uh, uh, skillers, they, they know how to groom dogs, but they can't make it. You know that average industry salary across the country is $29,000? Is that worth of money and time and effort and quality of the life we can have with that? And you end up shaving dogs all over that place because that's what we are. That's what the people want. So, and then I started to think about like, this doesn't make sense because it doesn't work. No matter how great coat cutter you are, you won't be able to make it better because it's not about the business. So what I discovered and what I try to teach and what I now do for myself, I don't talk anymore to a grooming industry. Grooming industry is not my main focus of talking. But why I'm talking to you then? Why you would join me to a challenge? It's exactly because I want to tell you where the money in this industry is. Not because I want to hide it from this end and I'm not telling you if you are not joining. It's all over the place. I'm talking it loud now. But at what I want you to know, you don't need to take my story and repeat it as your story. You can if you don't have your own story. I'm happy to give you. So you, you lay back on my story and use my knowledge, my programs and everything else to do with them whatever you want and to make money. Because the people are confused. The doggy moms are confused. The doggy parents are confused. They don't have where to move because about the dogs, no one knows nothing about the dogs. You, no, you cannot learn about dogs anywhere. Maybe a couple of, you, you learn on the veterinarian university, you, you learn a couple of things because the veterinarian university is part of the industrial system and it's always having a public health interest in mind. So when you do to study veterinarian, university I studied, then you study about animal health in regards to a human health, about animals as the machines for the human food production. And somewhere there, the dog is hidden, like a domesticated animal. And like a domesticated animal, no one cares about the dog. Zoologists are not thinking about animal because it's a domesticated animal. You cannot observe dog outside the influence of the humans. The veterinarians are interesting. Maybe some, you have here and there some publications coming out that are written by the enthusiasts and the people that are actually don't know where to turn for the knowledge about the dogs. But you dedicated your life. If you groom dogs, your grooming skills and coat cutting is just tip of the iceberg. Underneath 
is a tremendous encyclopedia of the dogs about knowledge that the people are eager to pay for. I got my back, I got my classes back. Like I sell my classes to the doggy moms now, how to communicate with their dogs better, how to feed their dogs better, how to do a lot of things better because I know all of those things I was doing them for the million dollar worth of show dogs. I know those secrets, I know that. You know that probably too, because that's why you are ended up in this business, because you know more about dogs than about the humans. But if that knowledge remains untapped in, you won't be able to take your grooming career to a next level. And what's a grooming career to a next level? Expand on existing clients. Give them what they want and what they want to pay for, but they don't have whom to. And that's how you turn your existing clients into much more than just code cutting clients. Once I started to revealing this program to my clients, to my audience, my visibility turned 1.3 million percent times almost overnight. And that came with the private consultations, with one-on-one -on -one classes, with interest in the people, I give a lot of time, a lot of things for free. I said, this is for free, try it yourself. This is for free, try it with a little extra, uh, extra struggle. If you can't put, and I get like millions of comments back, like, oh my God, this worked perfectly. Thank you so much for saving my, my dog from this, from that, blah, 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 blah. It's an amazing story. Some of them cannot do it themselves. So we have, what I want to share, how you develop these programs, do it yourself, do it with you, or do it for you, and how to turn your existing clients into much more paying customers. They want to spend money, just not on a coat cutting. That's what this industry need, an epiphany. This industry need to change, and it won't change by better grooming dogs, because we are best already at that. And yet, on the end of the year, you get like $29,000, it's almost below the, the existence. You can do nothing with that money. How I, I'm gonna release my, my, my scissors next month? It's gonna like $670 a pair. Because you do deserve it. And I don't want to, I said almost, entire my life was, oh my God, it'd be very expensive. The people cannot afford it. Now I'll teach you how to make money so you can afford them. I don't want to discount them. I don't, want to feel, I don't want to feel sorry anymore for the people that can change their lives over my right. The only thing that you need is a support. And I'm going to talk about knowledge, which kind of skills we need in order to cultivate that knowledge, and emotions and the branding, how the emotions are impacting our, oh, I don't want to do it today, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I can't do it because it's too hard. Oh, I can't do it because the people are going to judge me. Oh, I can't do it because of no matter what reason and the lie bypass. And the main time, we, if, we, uh, if we happen not to get sick or something like that, we might end up uh, waking one time and seeing where is my next step? Where do I go from there? How do you, how do you make more money? How, that, that's always, already, that's what, that was my biggest goal of, the, of this industry. Is how do you, if you have capacity of 20 dogs a day, your own grooming shop, your own one-man show. X is the maximum dog I can do a day, 20. And then the phone rings and you have 20 plus one, X plus one. Who grooms that dog? Are you fitting that dog by lowering the quality of the price, uh, lowering the quality of the grooming so you can fit more dogs, you can do it faster, or you hire a person to do one dog? And then you end up paying from your pocket. You pay someone to do that one dog. And occasionally you're gonna kind of now earning less money for making more job and employing more people. You have a people turning away from the industry wanting to go to be employees to someone. So they don't need to struggle with paying rents because it's unsustainable. Until you do not turn your dog coat cutting business into a dog care business. And that's what I want to teach you. That's why you should sign up. That's how you groom for greatness. Grooming for greatness means regroom your business. Not to retire, not to uh, sell it, not to learn how to make more money on the grooming dogs, but how to start promoting your business 
from the different angle with the knowledge you already have. Or if you don't have, you'll take what I know and then you use mine and said there was a Sasha instead of it's me. It's all possibility. That's why you should sign up for the seminar. It's free. There will be a lot of content that you can get there. And there will be a lot of ads on in order to kind of help you navigate from that where that environment where we're gonna go through that because the, the outcome the, the takeaway from those lessons would be valuable on their own. And from there, on the end of the show, I'm gonna show you what might and can be the next step of our interaction together. Or you will be set to do it on your own after the free event. Either or. That's why you should ask. And I'm grooming to show you I know how to do things. I know how to groom standard. I, I, I know how if you would come to me and say it's a Bouvier de Flandre, I would know how to read the standard and groom the Bouvier de Flandre that I never groomed in my life before the seminar in Belgium that I had, almost in the middle of the country where the, that, that uh, breed was, uh, was, um, was established. It happened that I was invited to a seminar that, uh, to do a Black Russian Terrier. And then the Black Russian Terrier was canceling. And the lady, that, because he got sick, and the lady that has that dog, he said, I don't have a Black Russian Terrier, I have a Bouvier de Flandre. He's just going to a world dog show in two weeks. So I would love Sacheries to put a hands on them. I said, like, I never in my life groomed Bouvier de Flandre. I never saw the one. And now I had, in a, in a night... In, like it was, a, it was a Friday when I arrived and the show is on Saturday morning. So I had from night till the morning to do this. I never watched the video. I never watched any picture of the dog because I didn't want to be impacted by anyone. I didn't want to do it like anyone. I knew what my homework is. I have my skills to do with my scissors whatever I want. And now I have a night to find a way what I want. And when the dog came, it was a show dog. And because I knew a show dog behave on a table, so I had a statue on the table with a plenty of coat. And I was just doing what the standard was telling me to do. I'm going to give you that knowledge as well. Because I know that you care much more for the grooming skill techniques and things like that. Much more than you can imagine what I want to offer you by dividing this day in three days. Like a knowledge, skills and a mindset or actually the, the emotions and the branding. How do you brand yourself? That's why you should sign up for this event. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like grateful for anyone that did. Because it's not only... Uh, grooming for greatness, how do you do it as 1% is doing it and even better than that? Because you are do, you're going to do it for your brand. You, I'll help you with the third day. I'll help you find out your story and your message and what's the story the people would, inside you already, the people would pay for. If you struggle to put out your product, oftentimes we are too much product centric the people doesn't care about the products the people doesn't care about what we talk about how great we are until we do not give them something they want they need and they want they feel like they need at the moment and by giving them what they need it's kind of grooming a bichon in front of you in three days talking a secrets about how to find the lines without me telling you these are the lines i gave you that for nothing other, other, other time you need to travel somewhere, you need to pay someone, you need to do something. Because I know this is not something that's going to change your life tomorrow, because you already know this. You maybe didn't know this, or you didn't know how to hold the scissors, or how to do it better. But maybe that's what you need. But what you really need is this paradigm shift that, that can happen if you sign up for the course. Not necessarily will happen. It's a possibility to happen. And the responsibility on us is to take a chance. Because when the chance comes, it's our to recognize it or not. It will come again, sooner or later. But just the que question is like in which form. And we won't be able maybe to recognize it again. So I, I'm not telling you that kind of you're going you're gonna to be uh, kind of uh, to encourage you to sign up. Because I know what I'm giving out. And I know... 
uh, what I structured my life around. And it's not something that I think. I was having a partner. We, we, br the, that partnership blow up like a, like a candle of something, whatever, like a popcorn. But, uh, and this is what I was talking about. I was talking about the right way to build a brand and a business and to build it from a scratch in the world that's blue ocean completely. No one is competing in the way, in the place I want you take, to take you. Oh, they said, like, damn, that's not, that's going to have to be communicated. It's terrible. It's, it cannot, that, that, that's not, that's not done. No one did it. And no one did it. It's not an excuse for you not to do it. So we ended up for almost leaving a million dollars, millions of dollars possibility partnership. We just needed to give a little more of our yes attitude to that partnership. And if we would be driving that relationship in a, look at how you say, Yeah, but possibly sneaky way, we would probably still be having our checks. But the possibility of giving up the dream for money that you know it's not going to bring because people don't need more stuff. People need problems solved. And the problem of the grooming is no matter how hard we try to groom perfect Bichon trim, it doesn't solve the problem of the average paying customer. Because the people that groom dogs like this usually would do it themselves. Or they would have a highly and respected, painful handler to do it for them. And they are doing it because they have money and they just want to support the sport, want to have their legacy in the breed for no matter what reason. But how much, is, how much you would be paid to groom a dog like this? Nothing. Nothing. You wouldn't have a client for this. Because the people on the end, they want to lay down with their dog on a sofa. After a long walk in a, in a wood or outside playing in a yard. So they don't want to brush and clean. Maybe you would have maybe 0 0.1 or 1 or even 10% of the people would do that. But that 10% is not what brings business. 10%, if you relay your business on a 10%, you are very much, very vulner, vulner, vulnerable. I was gambling in my life and I lost because I was the highly paid uh, handler and people were laughing at me. He's a con artist because he's charging so much. Every single client got an offer before the show and before the contracts gone signed. I, you're going to be my exclusive one. I'll have one dog. But when I lose that one dog, I lost everything. Some of my, some of my assistants would take me away, clients, because I was three times or five times, ten times more expensive than they offered. So she said, why would I pay him when they, these guys are doing 90% of the, of the job? And then Sasha comes, put three times uh, slaps with the scissors on the dog, takes the dog in a lead and just win the prize. But you don't know how much work is in that. How much work is in this 10% that I give to the end? And I was never, I, it was never hard for me to... Uh, uh, one client goes, the other come, come, because I have lined them up. That's what I want to teach you. That's why you should sign up for the, for the seminar, to get guilt away from your, from your shoulders. That there is something that you can learn more about the code cutting that can improve your business. There is nothing more you need to learn. There is nothing more you can learn. There is nothing more you can sell to the people that are actually not buying that. People don't need nicer code cut. What the people need is a support because the people owning a dog as a special type of the people, wounded people, a lonely people, people that are looking for the answers, people that are looking for the, for the, for the understanding, they are just hard to deal with because they are hurted through the time and through the life like we, we are. That's why we ended up in this industry because it's easier to deal with the dogs than with the people. But on the, as I said in the invitation, on the end of the day, more you learn about the quality of this business, you more understand how much skills you need in order to deal with the people because the people are swiping the cards, not the dogs. So the, 
the dog is the object of our business, but the subject of our business is the owner. That's the who really cares. The dog in our business is dog, in someone else's business is, a, is a potatoes, in someone else's business is a, is, a, is a bread, or someone is selling something, or some car. So that's the object of the business. What, what's you, what unites you and the clients? The love for dogs, life for cars, life for bakery, life for singing, life for winery. So love for dogs. But who can be united to introverts? People that cannot deal with the other people. And there is a way from that, because I was introvert. I'm still introvert. For me to talk like this, you don't know what's going inside me. It's very unpleasant. My legs are shaking usually half of the, half of the show, but still won't stop me. If I cannot come on six, I'll come on seven. If I can come today, I'll come tomorrow, but I'll come. Nothing will stop me. That's what I want to teach you. That's what I want to show you, and all of that for free. Down there is a place where we can unite in a business cooperation, and it's for everyone that wants. But without that either, you will be able to take a lot from that show. Uh, okay, with that said, I think I'm done here because I don't want to take your time. I have all lines set today, and tomorrow I'm going to make a nice little show for you by finishing this little dog completely. Probably I won't talk as much because I'm going to I'm going to let you enjoy the show. So I'm going to run the music on the computer and I'm just going to just going to zone out and finish this as I would usually do that on my artistic skill uh, seminars when I call them silent seminars. I had them couple hosted with other people that groom dogs. One was in in Ina Smirnova from Russia. She was grooming the Bichon and the other one was a f uh, amazing friend of mine and Dushko Pilevich, he was grooming English Cocker Spaniel. And uh, I'll gonna, I'll, I, I did a Continental Poodle as well in the, the silent seminar. So it's kind of like I let you enjoy and watch what I do without me uh, taking away your attention. I'll try to have a setup so you can see it from more angles. Maybe I'll, I'll kind of like, uh, I don't know how we can do that. Maybe we can move multiple cameras so you can see more. But I prefer tomorrow I'll not, I won't talk. And then once I'm done, we can, we can go over the picture. So, and I'm again extending your invitation to join me and to sign up for this amazing event that we created. It's a lot of time, like a lot of years. It's Friday noon, Eastern time. I knew that you already uh, probably dedicated your time to, time to something, but it's, it's, it's really, it's gonna be a mind blowing. No matter what you are turning to, where do you go? You need to have a knowledge sorted, skills for that knowledge to be expressed, and mindset in a way of branding and emotions, not to run in a circle of the self-sabotage. That's very, very common for the, for, for the people. We, we, we feel this. Uh, we, we, we are just in the beginning, just at a great point, and then everything collapses. And again, we, are, we reach some, per and everything collapses. And we are just now this time, and everything collapses. And over and over and over and over and over. Like, I was, I was, I was grateful enough, like, we are really, like, a really skyrocketing this uh, business from scratch, from zero, after leaving this partnership that was really... Uh, not hurting us emotionally, but, but it was like, you know, when you get disappointed because the people just don't want or cannot hear, I was blaming myself because I was not able maybe to communicate harder and better and easier for them to understand. Because oftentimes, as a teacher, I might, appear, I might appear, as I said yesterday, very tough and strong. And not that I have, I have your interest in, in I, I have your success as my interest, so I, I can do whatever I want in order to get you where you want to go. So I try to be a better version of myself as well, trying to soften, trying to understand, trying to value a little more the uh, internal uh, process of every one of you uh, and, a, and, and kind of a decision, even if that means for no matter what reason, I don't want to go there. I, I don't want to, even oftentimes we would find a satisfaction, it's kind of satisfaction in that final you know, final failure that comes. Like oftentimes the people would make this decision and they would feel great. I show them my true color and my true face and I stood up for myself. And then next, you know, entire, entire, entire everything just, just collapses as a, as a, as a cool out karate.
house of, house of cards because it was never your castle actually. This, this branding, this, this uh, three-day event is not about a grooming techniques. It's about a pet care, dog care, holistic. How would you start a top client on this type of grooming or is it only taking certain show and trim? So again, the, to achieve this type of grooming, you need really to have a dedicated clients. Uh, they need to, you know, uh, the dog need to behave this is a weekly trim, so you need to have a dog that enjoys that time, so you need to start a puppy trim from the scratch, like a dog need to come, start coming to the, to the, to the grooming to you and to uh, kind of develop a relationship with you as soon as possible on a weekly basis. Then you're going to be able to maintain the coat, the dog need to have a proper nutrition at home, supplementation at home, so the, the coat quality, for the coat to stand and to be full and to be good, the dog needs to be nourished from within. So you need to have a nutrition properly at home. You need to have a dog behaving in a sense of he wants to allow you to groom him for long hours and often time. And then you are able to develop your skills that you already have in order to learn the trim and to implement the standard of the breed be visible uh, to the eye of the viewer, call them judge. And I would tell again, if you would focus your career on doing this on clients, you will never have a uh, possibility to charge as much as you need compared to time that you will need in order to develop your skills to this point and then to put them in practice of everyday use. So what I love to do now is I encourage my students to practice these trims on the model dogs. So you practice your art and you know that you know. And then you go to the shop and do what the people are doing and paying you to do. And do it from the different angle. You're gonna still know how to do it, but you wouldn't regret because the client wants what they want you will develop a different relationship with them. So they might start coming more often to you for the coat cutting, but paying you for something you already know about dogs, but you don't know that that's something that the people would pay you for. The people are hungry for the knowledge about the proper dog care. They don't know where to turn. Do you know what's the biggest number, biggest industry within the industry? Like a pet care industry is closely like now three thirty billion dollars worth of and closely going towards 500 very easily, especially if recession or whatever going to come worse in this uncertain time. It's always great for the business of the pet care. We just need to position ourselves on the right place so we don't get affected by the by the by the by the terrible outcome of our business by earning twenty nine thousand dollars a year. A cut after we pay all the rents and everything else, people and everything. It's you, uh, someone that earns twenty nine thousand dollars is very much affected with the recession. Very much, and yet the industry skyrockets every single time when the recession comes. So what we need to do there? Uh, you, what, that, what I wanted to say: you have like a, a food industry, and the veterinarians of those. Total of $300 billion worth of industry are making 80%. The rest of 20% is made, is divided by the rest. Boarding, daycare, uh, retail, and, uh, and, uh, and the grooming. And every, on any, any other type of pet care, pet care business. So, but 80% is gone to veterinarians and the food. How to take a share of that portion? and put it in your pocket, because the people are paying for that anyhow. They don't know where to turn. Vets are expensive, and they don't know the holistic approach. Because as I explained to you, the triangle of the behavior, nutrition, and coat care is something that only you can provide, because you have skills that are most difficult to develop, holding scissors and grooming dogs. Those skills are most difficult to develop yet most cheaper are paid for. But, uh, but, uh, but the fundamental of the pet care is the behavior and nutrition. 
And that's what I did perfectly in my life because I was handling show dogs that were nourished with a food that is still not an, of mainstream, mainstream interest. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you what does it mean when I say transform yourself and transform your business from the local dog coat cutter into a celebrity pet care expert. First in a local community, and then you can go away from your little city, from your street, from your, from your town, from your country, from, your, from the states, into the world. Especially if you, because that's a creative mind, then you come up with some product, then you start selling something, then you become a brand, then you slowly become something that can provide to your family a dream that we all thought it can be achieved by cutting the coat. Okay. Hit the link below. See you tomorrow. Did, did you say when you want me to go? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here tomorrow. See you. Did you say when? No. How much people we had? 66. 66. So tomorrow this time as well. So 6, 7, 6, 30, 6, 30, 7 p.m., huh? 7 p.m. Eastern time. Is that okay? Now? But can we, can we do something else? So it's, how, can you see it nicely or no? Show me how it looks like. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Okay. So tomorrow, um, tomorrow let's do 6.30. 6.30 tomorrow, Eastern time, to finish this baby. And then uh, Friday, noon, sign up for this amazing event. I'm going to take you through the amazing journey of how to transform your uh, pet your uh, the coat cutting, dog coat cutting, so-called grooming business into a celebrity pet care, um, pet care business. Thank you so much for your time. I love you so much for your, for your wonderful words and support. I welcome you to our event. I uh, say hi until tomorrow, um, uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, stay blessed, happy, healthy, and God bless you all. Bye.